Life Audio. Faith Over Fear is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational, faith affirming podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Hello. Welcome to the Faith Over Fear podcast, where we attack our most pervasive fears with truth. Because life is too short for any of us to live enslaved. At Holy Love Ministries, we are passionate about helping God's children discover, embrace, and live in God's freedom. We would love to connect with you online. Just visit our show notes to learn how to connect with us. Why choose Del One? Del One Federal Credit Union has been proudly helping members reach their goals since 1960. As the largest credit union in Delaware, Del One has branch locations throughout the state, complemented by complete digital access to your financial accounts. Del One is much more than just a full service financial institution. It's a place where members are treated like family. Choose Del One today and start building your own financial success story. Visit Del One.org for more information. Del One is an equal opportunity lender. Deposits are insured by NCUA. Hey everybody, I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. We're hosts of the Kainos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in everyday settings. To learn more and subscribe, go to lifeaudio.com. I'm Jennifer Slattery. And I'm Kelly Campbell. For the next series of episodes, we're going to be talking about a man named Abram, later called Abraham, who came from a messed up family and background and who became the father of the Jewish nation and led to the lineage of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Now, we're starting his story in the beginning, his family of origin. But going forward, our team will likely touch on some of the same themes and issues, and which we feel like that's applicable because our lives often do that as well. We've probably all been in unhealthy situations and relationships, and maybe that's where you're at now. And you might know you need to make a change, but that might feel terrifying. What if you end up alone or what if you end up with worse friends? Oh, Jennifer, I definitely feel that because for my situation, I was early in 2000, I was elected to political office in here in my hometown and I was barely 30. I was the youngest person ever elected in this particular area. And all of a sudden I had a lot of friends, a whole lot of friends. And I was somebody, I met presidents, I met governors, and I just had all these people around me all the time. And it really kind of fed my ego. It made me feel like I was special. But then in 2009, I had a stroke and that stroke left me with a physical disability that left me unable to do all the things that I was doing. And I realized that out of my hundreds and hundreds of friends, I literally could count on two hands the number that would come to the hospital. It was less than 10. And those were the friends that were just there because they loved me. They weren't looking for anything. They weren't hanger-ons. They just wanted to know, how can I help? And that was really all I was asking for. I realized these were the people who saw me and didn't see what I could do for them. But it was still terrifying because I thought now people are going to forget who I am and people aren't going to love me because I can't do this stuff for them. Yeah. And I hear that from people, especially if they are in unhealthy relationships, like if there's like some kind of codependency, what if I don't continue rescuing this person? Or what if I say no here and I'm going to lose this relationship? And I think a lot of times it can come down to the lie where we don't believe we're worthy. We feel like we're unworthy of healthy connection or, and maybe this is connected, we feel that we're not able to build the depth of relationship that we crave. And I think we need to remember that God is the God of restoration. He is actively restoring all things to how they should be. And there's a quote I know you had talked about before that you just really love when we're talking about kind of making healthy change. Yes, it's one of my favorite quotes because I think there's just so much truth to it. And it's basically the pain of the situation has to outweigh the pain of change in order for us to move forward, because change is very painful. But sometimes our situation gets so bad that it's worth stepping out into that change to make a difference. Yeah. And I think sometimes we're not even necessarily aware of how bad when we're kind of in the situation of how 
painful it is and really how good it could be. And so I think that can really make it challenging as well. And, and when I think about, so Abram's story, and I know you're going to read a little bit in a minute for those who aren't familiar with his story. But when I think about just what scripture, what kind of what we're going to be walking through, I think about it through that lens like God calling people really all through scripture, but God calling people to this place of healing and health and restoration that feels comfortable when you don't even know what that looks like. When we think about making radical God led changes, I am reminded of how Abram's journey began. And so Genesis 11, 27 to 30 tells us this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Now, Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. You know, Jennifer, I think so many times this is one of those verses that we kind of glaze over. All we see is lots of names and who married who and who was the child of who. But it's even mentioned in the New Testament when in the account of Stephen and in Acts 7, verse 2 and 3, he says to this, he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. That's a big change. Yeah, well, and I know you've spent a lot of time actually studying the city that God first called Abram and his family out of, correct? Yes. So they were living in a land called Ur, just you are. And the thing about Ur at that time and Abram's time is that it was probably one of the most populated and lush regions of the area, of the whole earth, the known earth at that time. So think about LA, you know, or, or New York City, something big and metropolitan for that time. And his dad, Tara, that family were well bigwigs. They had money, they had land, they had political clout, they had hundreds of servants, their own little private army, but it wasn't the best place to be. It was very much a pagan land. It was very much a land of what we would call a polytheistic land. That means they worshiped many gods. And the biggest god they would worship was the moon god, which funny enough, the moon god's name is Sin. I wonder if that's where we get the name, maybe. It from might Fortune. be. <laughs> yes. Now, and, and we don't really know. I mean, this was so far back in history. We don't know for certain what their world was like, what their culture was like. But we do know from other places in scripture that with this type of worshiping multi-false gods, so, which actually scripture tells us were really demons. So there is a forces of good and evil. And so when you worship demons, your life often looks very chaotic. And so we know from, like I said, reading in other places in scripture that a lot of times involved in this idol worship, a lot of times there was like temple prostitution, child prostitution, child sacrifice. If God is bringing us to increased wholeness and restoration, then anything that moves us away from that is automatically going to be moving us towards increased death and decay and dysfunction. And so I just have to believe that this environment that Abram was living in that he had grown up in, I have to believe it was manipulative and violent and dysfunctional and and just a place of chaos and maybe even where for him, maybe chaos has, had felt normal. Like that was his family structure, the way he was had learned to relate to people. Absolutely. And we also don't know from scripture just how many generations back the family went. We, and we know the Bible talks of Tara's ancestors, ancestors. So this may have been something we have a, a sunny in the South where, where I'm at that we did it because my daddy did it. My granddaddy did it. My great granddaddy did it. And you get to this generation. Nobody knows why they did it. It's just always been that way. And so I think we get comfortable in bad situations because we don't even see it as bad anymore. And I'm sure that was the case with with one. Well, actually, as we look into his story going forward and we just follow this new family that God is creating, which really is ultimately pointing us to his family, because 
you know, the, just throughout scripture, God uses the language of family and he adopts us as believers, Christ followers into family as well. Kind of that idea of what family should look like. But we can see Abram's family, both with how he behaved in the passages we're going to be following just in, in the next coming episodes. But then also following after that, there was a lot of dysfunction throughout scripture. And I do have to believe like if God is always moving the needle towards increased health. But we can just see if we look at some of the behaviors, his worldview, his perspective, it appeared very warped to me. Yeah, very much so. And I think it continues to go back to kind of that generational baggage he was carrying and going back to the lie of not feeling like he was able to get out of it or able to connect with somebody outside of that, even though he knew God had called him to it. Why choose Del One? Del One Federal Credit Union has been proudly helping members reach their goals since 1960. As the largest credit union in Delaware, Del One has branch locations throughout the state, complemented by complete digital access to your financial accounts. Del One is much more than just a full service financial institution. It's a place where members are treated like family. Choose Del One today and start building your own financial success story. Visit dell-one.org for more information. Del One is an equal opportunity lender. Deposits are insured by NCUA. Hi, I'm Cynthia Garrett, and I'm inviting you to join us on Cynthia Garrett's Girl Club on Life Audio. It's a pretty powerful place where real girls are having real talk about real issues and applying real faith. One, probably not really knowing what God had called him to. I think there's a point in our lives, like, let's say we are, maybe we have related with our parents in a certain way. And we are beginning to recognize we're, we're getting in, in healthier environments. Maybe we're building relationships within the church and we're reading scripture about speaking truth and love. And we're watching the behavior of Jesus and watching how when he set boundaries and when he acted in loving ways. And I mean, boundaries are loving too, but we're just kind of watching his behavior and we're noticing a disconnect in, you know, that our relationships don't necessarily resemble that. And we may not even know, like, so we we're like we're in that that messy middle, I guess, where yes. okay, we don't want this anymore, but we don't even know what God is necessarily calling us to. And and I see that in Abram's story as well. And that's when we just have to remind ourselves there's a there's a verse that I remind myself of often when I'm kind of walking through my own messy middle, especially if God is calling me to a very challenging or frightening place of obedience or or way to obey. And it's what Jesus said in John chapter 10, when he said, he promised, I, I came that you might have life and have it to the full, or some translations say abundant life. Well, he gave two kind of contrasts. He said, the thief came to steal, kill and destroy. I came that you might have life. And so I keep that in my mind. Okay. At one, I'm either moving towards one or the other. And so if God is calling me to obedience, he also promised me vibrant life. And so I may not know what that life looks like now, but I know the only way I'm going to find it in my relationships and in my life, not to <laughs> repeat the word, but in my life is by following him wholeheartedly. Absolutely. And I would add to that kind of letting go of what we think it should look like, because the life God is calling us to may look very different than the life we thought we were going to have, or even the life we think we're moving towards. And I think a lot of that courage and letting go of that lie is knowing that God has my best interest, that even if it doesn't look the way I think it should, I'm like you said, I'm going to keep going toward that light, that life abundant, that life fulfilled. You know, I would love to circle back to your story. Looking back, so your relationships, a lot of them, I assume, have drastically shifted. Drastically is an understatement. Okay. Absolutely. Potentially prior to your stroke, did you kind of feel like your relationships were pretty good, pretty fulfilling? Like life was like, yes, but looking back, they weren't really. Yes. You know, I, yes. They were fulfilling in my own eyes. They were not fulfilling for my soul or my spirit. But today, I mean, I tell people this a lot and they always look at me like I'm nuts if I could go back to the night that I had my stroke and not have it, I wouldn't because there are so many people in my life, you, Holy Loved, my church, other people that I would never have met had this not happened. And comparing these relationships to my old relationships, it's literally night and day. You know, when you're in relationships, when you're constantly afraid of the other shoe falling, you're constantly afraid 
of saying something wrong and that person's going to get mad and leave or say something bad about you. That's not a healthy, that's not what God calls us for community. You know, being around people I know who love me and support me and love me enough to call me out when I'm not doing something right in a loving way brings such a peace and such a sense of security that I just, like I said, I wouldn't change it. Yeah. So you're describing the difference between safe versus unsafe relationships. And if we haven't fully experienced safe relationships, and I will probably put a, a caveat that no human relationship is completely safe. Like we are not Jesus. We will not love one another like Jesus. And there's grace in that. But in healthy, safe relationships, when you don't love one another like Jesus, like you said, you talk about it and you're honest about it and then you move forward. And the unsafe relationship, it keeps us in a place. So I, I think I'd like to speak to those who are maybe in that place where like, OK, if I know this relationship isn't safe, but I'm afraid to set boundaries that would make it safe or healthy. And, and when I say safe, I, I say safe and healthy interchangeably because I'm afraid of hurting this person or I'm afraid of harming this relationship. And I think just reminding ourselves, I can live in a state and they too, because if it's unhealthy for us, it's unhealthy for them. Like there's no way it can be unhealthy for one person and healthy for unless we're Jesus. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's what my perception is, but I can live in a state of perpetual inner angst. Or bouts of angst, because we might have bouts of joy and bouts of peace, or I can move steadily towards increased peace, which biblically means it means wholeness, right? So we're back to that restoration picture. Absolutely. And, you know, what you talk about angst, it's that it's the difference between feeling peaceful, even in the middle of the storm versus feeling like you're in a storm, even when things are quiet. That's really good. I think you need to say that again. I think that's that's a really good way for us to look at when we're, tr- especially if we're new to this yeah. relational health thing. Like, And I think we have to also mention, as we do our own healing journey, we may feel perpetually stormy from our own stuff that we're going through. So there's kind of, you're kind of walking that two-part line there, but say that again. So for me, it was the difference between feeling peace, even in a storm, even when things weren't going well, I still had people around me that I knew made me feel peaceful versus feeling stormy, feeling anxious, even when things were quote unquote good, even when things were calm. Yeah, that's really good. And I think that's a great place for us to end just with the reminder too: we experience peace in all its fullness through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, the more we grow in our relationship with him and then align our lives to how he wants us to live. And so I think that's a really great something for us just to focus on in this new year going ahead. Like we don't have to have it all figured out. Abram certainly didn't have it all figured out. We just need to say, okay, God, I'm going to take this next step in this relationship. I'm going to take this next step in my personal healing. And I'm going to trust that when I'm off path, you're going to redirect me. And I'm going to trust that you're going to take me somewhere much better than where I've been. Amen. Well, thank you for listening. We hope that we gave you some things to think about that maybe encourage you as you're taking your steps forward. If you haven't already done so, we encourage you to subscribe. We've got a lot of great podcast episodes coming up and we would love it if you would rate it. That helps others to find it and it encourages our team as well. Make sure to share it on social media, through email. And until next time, may you live as one who truly has been set free. Faith Over Fear is a production of Life Audio and Salem Media. If you liked what you heard today, please take a second to rate and review this podcast in your favorite podcast app so that more listeners like you can find the show. For more faith-filled, inspirational podcasts, visit us at lifeaudio.com. Why choose Dell One? Dell One Federal Credit Union has been proudly helping members reach their goals since 1960. As the largest credit union in Delaware, Dell One has branch locations throughout the state, complemented by complete digital access to your financial accounts. Dell One is much more than just a full-service financial institution. It's a place where members are treated like family. Choose Dell One today and start building your own financial success story. Visit dell-one.org for more information. Dell One is an equal opportunity lender. Deposits are insured by NCUA.